Okay, let's dive into the content. So today we'll look at flow models. It's a different type of likelihood model compared to the one we saw last week. Um, there will be some connections, there will be some differences. Um, it's kind of interesting because when we taught this class the previous time, spring 2020, flow models were seeing a big up-ramp in popularity. Um, a lot of new results were coming out. But since then, actually not a whole lot of new stuff has come out. Almost nothing new has come out. Um, that could be an opportunity that maybe people have been missing the right insights to make them better than they were four years ago. Or it could be that fundamentally there is something that's not as general about them, and so they don't keep getting better with more data, more compute, the way other models have. Um, I guess we don't know, but um, it's something to be aware of. If you were to essentially be a product builder today, and you're asked to build a product with a generative model, it's very unlikely a flow model would be your first choice. But as a researcher, I think it's really good to understand how they work, what they can give you, and maybe there's opportunities for improvement, or maybe not. It's, you know, we'll find out in the future. So, let's go back to what do we want from a generative model. We want a good fit to the training data. Really, the underlying distribution, not just memorizing the data, but somehow understanding the distribution the data is coming from. For a new X, the ability to evaluate the probability of that X, is it a likely or unlikely X under the distribution? Ability to sample from the learned distribution and generate new samples that way. And a latent representation or embedding space, that's meaningful can be nice to have because then maybe you can train something on top of that or you can do interpolations between different items that are meaningful. Recall lecture two, autoaggressive models. Um, they actually check many boxes, um, except the sampling is serial, one pixel at a time, one token at a time. So it's slow to generate things. There's no parallelization during generation. Autoresive models lack a latent representation or embedding space. Yes, you can fine tune them, but there's still not that natural kind of setup that you have in some other models like the one we'll cover today and in some future lectures, some other models. And at least in terms of what experimentally has been successful, autoresive models have been really about discrete data. And it might have something to do with the serial aspect. I'm not saying it's guaranteed to be the case but because it's serial. If you go continuous, it's often hard to stay on distribution. And then once you sample one thing, the next thing you go further and further off distribution and all bets are off. Whereas with discrete, you're almost naturally rounded back onto distribution in some sense. And so maybe with these serial generation models, discrete can just naturally uh, work better. But again, I mean, these are not proven things. These are just considerations. Flow models, well, I should check all the boxes uh, in some sense, but so far the performance is not as good as for the other models. So you get all your boxes checked, but not with the same level of performance as some of the other models have. Let's see. So our goal will be to fit a density model P theta of X with now a continuous x in some n-dimensional space. Um, what do we want? The things I listed on the previous slide. Good fit to the training data, ideally the underlying distribution, ability to evaluate p theta of x, so do inference, ability to sample, and hopefully a good um, embedding space. We'll go in uh, really three steps here and then have a little extra uh, bit on dequantization. Um, so we'll start with 1D flows, lay the foundations for everything we'll do next. We'll do 2D as the kind of simplest generalization of that, and then we'll see the general version, which we'll directly build on everything we'll have covered by then. The last part, dequantization, what does that refer to? Um, as I said, flow models are for continuous valued variables, hence distributions over, I guess, real numbers or um, vector valued um, real, real numbers. Um, what if your data is discrete? The notion of dequantization is the idea that you turn your discrete data into continuous data so that your data becomes a fit for training a continuous density model on the data. 
might seem a bit weird if the data is actually discrete, why would you make a continuous fault to make it fit with these kinds of models? You kind of have to do it, and we'll see why. Okay, so we'll work with probability densities this time rather than discrete um, distributions. So quick reminder, what does it mean to be a probability density? Here is one example, P of x, um, at any given um, point along the x-axis, you can read off a value for P of x. But that P of x, for example, this P of, P of x over here, which is about four, doesn't mean that the probability of the corresponding thing down here is four, that's not the meaning with the density. With the density, the meaning is that if you take any finite interval and you take the integral over that interval, you get the probability of your sample landing inside that interval. So the meaning is the probability of x landing at interval a, b is the integral over that interval of p of x. So for example, naturally at the peak, a lot of density is located, but really what it means is that if I take an interval, Maybe this interval here, call this A, call this B, then the integral is the area under the curve in that interval, and that is the probability associated with landing in that section. The probability of any specific number is actually zero with these continuous valid distributions, because um, then your interval is zero length, and if it's zero length, then the integral is zero. Okay, um, how to fit a density model? Let's say we have some continuous data, and we now want to fit a maximum likelihood model, as we've seen in the last lecture. It's a pretty natural way to fit. If you can formulate your fitting problem as a maximum likelihood problem, you get a lot of good properties. So we take a parameterized density model, P theta, and then maximize the log likelihood of the training data under uh, that model, and equivalently, since most optimizers these days are set up to be minimizers rather than maximizers, you formulate the negative log likelihood as your training objective and then run your optimizer to hopefully find a good minimum or the minimum if there's a global minimum. Okay, so that's very similar to what we saw last time. Um, <coughs> by the way, I just want to flag this. It is possible when you have continuous data to discretize it and then fit a discrete model. It is an option. In some sense, it's what pictures do. The real world is, well, I guess it's photons, so it's hard to know. I mean, but how much energy do the photons have? Is it quantized? It's pretty complicated, but it's closer to continuous than discrete. We turn it into pixels, which is discrete. Same with speech. We turn it into discrete values before we did anything with it in last lecture. It is a possibility. It can make sense at times, but not what we're covering today. So we're going to fit a density model to this data. What's an example of a density model? A mixture of Gaussians, or you know, there could be two Gaussians in this case, there could be more than two. How do you represent that? The probability density, again this is a density, um, is the weighted sum of the densities associated with each of the Gaussians. So in the simplest case, if you have two Gaussians, maybe each has a weight of a half, and you do one half weight on the first one, one half on the second one, and then these two Gaussians just get summed together with half weight each, and together form the probability density. Well, generally, if you had a mixture of Gaussians, the parameters you would try to learn are the mixture weights that have to sum to one, and then the mean of each Gaussian and the, let's say, standard deviation or variance of each Gaussian. Now, even though that might sound good and maybe for some scenarios you want to fit a mixture of Gaussians, we know that ultimately we're interested in fitting high dimensional distributions. So we want to think a little bit ahead. Even though right now we're thinking about 1D data, we want to do it in a way that we think ahead to high dimensional data. And so what happens, let's say, when you're trying to fit a mixture of Gaussians to images. You have a bunch of images, which are high dimensional vectors, right? you are going to fit a mixture of Gaussians to them. And then you sample from that mixture of Gaussians. If this image was in the training data, you might end up with something like this, because effectively you're saying that near, maybe that's one of the means, near the mean of your fit, 
a Gaussian perturbation is acceptable and still makes for a good image. But that's actually not true. Once you perturb every pixel with Gaussian noise, you get actually a very unlikely picture. And so this notion that fitting a bunch of Gaussians would lead to a good result in high dimensional space would clearly be flawed for images. Because nearby, there's actually no, not that many good images. So somehow that notion of like nearby is not correct in the original pixel space. Now, I'm saying not correct in the original pixel space. You can imagine what we're going to do next. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to transform from the original space into another space. So flows are, a, when I say a flow or a flow model, it refers to the transformation from X into Z. You have some input X, a bunch of computation happens, gets turned into Z. Yes, question. So this is going to be the same as the same in the previous slide. Sure. Right, yeah. I like the way you phrased it, and to, to play it back through through the recording also, um, essentially, the problem if we use a mixture of Gaussians to model image data in pixel space is that if we want to assign higher probability to any of our training images, we're automatically also assigning higher probability to very nearby images as measured in pixel space. And I show you an example of what a nearby pixel, uh, a nearby image in pixel space looks like. And it's not a desirable image to generate. It's not a natural image that would be in our natural image distribution. And so it forces that density to be also on that image, which we don't want. Another question. If you did a mixture model, so say a mixture of Gaussians model on images, if you wanted to get your original images to at least to be regenerated reliably, you probably need the mixture component for each of the original images, but you'll still have that leaking into what's nearby. If you have less mixture components, you'll have you know weird interpolations in pixel space happening between these existing images that are not natural images at all, but will still have a high probability density associated with them. And so clearly, directly fitting a continuous distribution that is a mixture of Gaussians in that original pixel space would lead to a result that is not, not a great result that we're looking for. Yeah? Um, is it because we think that it's hard to learn these uh, parameters or because it's not possible to moderate? The That's a good question. Is it a learnability question or is it a just the representation would be flawed. If you just use a mixture of Gaussians directly in pixel space, the representation is just flawed. Even the best choice of parameters, if you found the local, no, no, the global optimum of parameter settings, you would still end up with something that has the same issue, where these two images with, that are shown on the slide would have similar probability density associated with them. Um, you could say, what about in the extreme if I put super tall peaks on every training data point, and I don't let anything leak, it's just like zero variance peaks, well, then you got nothing but your training data covered. Now you literally have no generalization at all. So either you literally memorize your training data, or you get this kind of thing where you put probability on neighboring things as measured neighboring in pixel space, which would lead to non-natural images. Yes? So yeah, question, good question. What if we tried a different distribution rather than a Gaussian? And I think that, that kind of really gets to the core of the lecture. I love that question. Um, what, what choices do we have, right? I mean, we have Gaussians. We can do a mixture of Gaussians. Um, maybe there are a couple of other parameterized distributions out there that we can 
um, somehow you know represent analytically and then do an optimization over. But the choices are not there's not that many choices essentially that we have to work with, and so that's why what we're going to do is we're going to in some sense admit defeat that the number of parameterized distributions that we get to work with are relatively small and none of them are a natural fit for natural images or for other type of data like speech. But maybe after transformation of variables, if we choose the right transformation of variables, they could become a natural fit. And because we'll train them, that we'll train the transformation of variables such as to try to get a good fit we're training that transformation to make those really limited expressiveness distributions still succeed at modeling the data in this new space. So that's that's the idea with flow models. Um, but you're right. If we had a very rich suite of distributions to choose from somehow, um, which we don't, but if we had, maybe we could directly try to model one of those. But this is one way to get that. We're going to say the way we achieve a wider range of distributions is by considering transformations of variables and only fitting after that. And that way we have much more flexibility. And so the flow is the transformation of variables. So a flow model will take the original input, process it, and generate an embedding z, which we'll call f theta of x, some function of x. And we're trying to learn that function because we want to somehow transform things such that we land in a space where, let's say, a Gaussian or maybe another easy to parameterize distribution would be a good fit to fit that transform data. In flow models, we also require that, that f theta is invertible. So if you go from x to z, you should be able to go right back to x. That's convenient, right? Because if you learn an invertible mapping, well, if this z is a comes from a distribution that's easy, like a Gaussian or a uniform or something, that you can just sample from that Gaussian or uniform, use the inverse mapping, and generate an X that comes hopefully from the right distribution that you care about. Um, note that it's also limiting, right? And we'll see that. That's if I really skip ahead. I think why flow models maybe haven't reached the same level of performance as many of the other models is the fact that this has to be invertible. And being invertible constrains you um, quite a bit. I think, if anything, it's surprising how good they've been despite this constraint. So maybe it could be even better and could be surprised even more in the future. But that constraint means, for example, that z will have the same dimensionality as x. Because otherwise, actually, you can't do the inverse mapping. Um, also, if you don't want it to be invertible, you feel it's too constraining, you want to maybe learn the inverse mapping and say, why not map one way and then learn in the other direction? Sure, next lecture. VAE, lecture four, is essentially the same thing, but we'll learn the inverse, um, making things more flexible. Your Z can have a higher or a lower dimension than X, it's all okay. But it is an interesting question, right? Because if you construct it with F theta invertible, a lot of your problems are automatically solved. Sampling becomes just an inversion. So very, very simple to get that done. OK, so that's the main idea. We transform x into z. We're going to learn that transformation. And then we're going to fit a distribution to the transformed variables that we have an easy parameterization for. Yes? Yeah, it's a really good question. How, how do you know whether the distribution class that you assume might or might not be a good fit, or the neural network that structure that you're assuming might or might not be a good fit? I think there's no perfect recipe for that. I think the, the kind of best practice is something along the lines of you check in the literature for similar data, um, what has seemingly worked well for other people. That can give you some intuition. Then when you start running your own experiments, you might first run an experiment where you only have one training example. 
and you make sure that at least the one training example, it knows what to do with it, because that should be easy. It should be able to just overfit. That's also a debugging thing, make sure it works. From there, you go to a few more training examples. You make sure the fit is there. Again, it's not the model you want, but it checks that your model class is expressive enough to at least capture what's in your training data. Then you might actually see if you can overfit your entire training set. Again, that shows that your model has the capacity to do it. That might be good. It might be that it means you're overfitting, but then that's the thing you can resolve after that. You say, okay, I'm fitting the training data. I'm memorizing a little too much. Maybe I need more regularization, other things, you know, drop out, all kinds of things that might help it regularize rather than being fully overfit. But I would go from, you know, look at the literature, try to overfit to then make sure in the end that it also generalizes. I see. Yeah, instead of generalization, you just basically try out different regularization techniques and avoid data augmentation techniques. Yeah, I mean, these things tend to not be very well prescribed, but Exactly. You try different levels of regularization. You might try different learning rates. You might try um, different data augmentation techniques. And there are many of them out there. Um, you might also try a different model class. You might think that maybe a certain model class has a better inductive bias than another model class. Right? For example, a fully connected like multilayer perceptron for learning a visual representation might not be so ideal, might not generalize as well as, let's say, a convnet or a transformer model. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I guess, dark art in some sense that, that you need to acquire over time. Yes? Is it safe or dangerous to assume that neural networks are not generally bijective functions from the domain of S to the domain of Z? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. It's, it's really the crux of, of a lot of what's coming in class. But just to preview, most neural nets will not be an invertible transformation. So a lot of what you need to do with flow models is to constrain your neural network to make sure it is invertible. And not just invertible, but efficiently invertible. Because some functions are invertible, but take a tremendous amount of compute to invert, and then maybe it's still not the right um, function class to work with. So a lot of the effort goes into that. And in fact, I would argue it's not even perfectly understood. Like, how exactly does this constrain you? Um, I will show you a bit later that Flow models are fully general, that you can represent any distribution with a flow model, assuming a large enough flow model. But that's almost like saying, you know, any 1D distribution can be represented with a mixture of Gaussians. If you have enough mixture components, that doesn't mean it's like the, the right distribution in terms of inductive bias and so forth. But in that sense, the flow models are general. <laughs> if you're just like, okay, I'm going to just make a very large model. At some point, I can definitely fit things, but yeah. Yes. So I, just, I like this uh, idea. What if we think of the F theta as something like doing a Fourier tr transform? I think that's definitely a viable thing to put in there. Um, that's a viable change of basis that has worked well for a lot of signal processing applications. So you could definitely imagine that in that space, it's easier to fit the distribution than in the original space. Um, to some extent for images, maybe even to more extent for audio. Um, now, the hope might be that you can learn something even more general, but I think it is a good class of functions to, to consider. Um, one thing that I'll maybe foreshadow right now is that if, if you have a, one step is invertible and the next step is invertible, the composition is also, also invertible. So if your idea is to insert a Fourier transform, you could do that, followed by all the other things, followed by yet something else and so forth. So all your ideas can stack serially together which is pretty interesting. And that might also be why they actually do surprisingly well in that you can bring a lot of ideas to play in different layers such that you still get a decent amount of expressiveness. Yes? One last question regarding the flow model. Like, because you want it to be fully invertible, does that mean you're limited to which like activation functions you want to use? Like, for example, a sigmoid is invertible but like a ReLU is not because any of the negative values all get mapped to zero, so you can't bring it back. So do flow models restrict you from using certain activation functions? They absolutely do, yeah. As you said, a ReLU model maps everything negative to zero, so it's not invertible. can't put that in your network. <laughs>
Um, now, if you know everything is always positive, if you have a guarantee in your data, then but then the value is just a linear function, and um, not sure yeah, it matters to call the value then. So, so what do we need to do to fit um, this correctly? Because the last thing we want to do is just say, let's transform all our data into Z space, put it all onto the exact same Z, and then we do maximum likelihood on, the, on Z space, and we'll get such a great score because everything's on the same point and think that we're done because that, that doesn't work. It's not invertible, but also we don't want some um, close by version of that to be possible. So the right way to do it is just to study the change of variables formula. So if Z is a function of X, um, then let me draw this out here. So let's say X lives over here. We're in 1D, so it's easy to draw. Z lives over there. And Z is some function of X. For example, maybe a function like this of X. What that means is that if I have an X, for example, this X over here, it'll map to this C over there. Okay, um, now what we want is we really want to model the original data which will have a density. So maybe X has a density that, you know what, let's, let's, keep it, um, let's keep it somewhat simple. Let's say X has a density that is uniform. Up to here, let's say nothing goes past here. So X has a uniform density. Now, when I map to Z, I want essentially to be the case that as I look at an interval around X, this original X here, I look at the probability mass here, and then I want the density of Z to be such that that same mass gets mapped over to the nearby interval in Z space. So I take the um, left, let me add some color here. I take this point here, which is mapped over here. I take the other end of the interval, which gets mapped over here. And so I want the interval between the blue and the green to capture the same amount of integral for Z and for X. And so if we maybe look at this and we say, okay, this may be a slope of one half, the slope of one half, um, and then later the slope will be much steeper. What happens is that this interval here, because the slope is pretty shallow, actually gets mapped to a smaller interval in Z space. And so what it means is that for this small, if this mass all needs to be transported into the smaller interval in Z space, we will get actually a taller density for the Z space there to make sure that all the probability mass is spaced to get into. Because we, let's say, divide it in half the length of the interval, so it needs to be twice as tall to fit the same probability mass. That's from a kind of finite probability point of view what needs to happen. Um, the, here where the slope is much steeper, if we look at a small interval here, This small interval will actually be mapped to a wider interval. And so this probability mass on the x side is essentially the same, but on z it's much wider, and so the density here for z will be more something like this, right? And now we see there's a curve with a kink in it, so essentially what'll, what'll happen is everything up to that point will be behaving the same for z, so every, z will have something that looks like this, and then drops down here to this kind of density, and then it stops over here. So this here is the Z density we end up with for this particular transformation. Um, making that more precise at the kind of tiny interval level, the dx's and the dz's, what we're saying is that 
the density around the point x times dx needs to be the density around z times dz. But there needs to be the dz that corresponds to the dx. It needs to be just that when we transfer that interval from the horizontal axis to the vertical axis, it changed size. This dx and dz, they need to correspond. They're not the same size. You need to transform x to z space to see what that size is. And you might wonder, how much does that size change? That's this thing over here. This is dz over dx. It's measuring how much does it change when I go from x to z space. And what it really is is just a derivative of the function. So to know how much the density changes, we just need to look at the derivative of the function, and that'll tell us how much the density changes, because that tells how much the interval gets scaled up or scaled down locally. To compensate for that, the density goes the other way. Um, this, I mean, I'm obviously not proving this. I'm just trying to give some intuition for it. Um, this is a well-established result in standard probability theory. This is what underlies everything we do with flows. Because if we follow this prescribed formula, we know that now if we fit a density in z space, it will properly map back, map back out to a density in x space. There will be a proper correspondence between the two. Note that um, this thing here needs to be differentiable. Usually that's not a problem. Most functions that we like to use with neural nets are differentiable, so it's not a big requirement. Um, also needs to be invertible, otherwise we can't do this. Now, one of you might maybe say, well, is it really necessary to be invertible to do this? Can't we extend this, right? What if this continued and, you know, this function went back down here, you know, all the way here? What, ha what would happen if I took a function like that? So now my function is f theta goes like this and continues and there is some coming back down, so not invertible. I can still transport a probability mass, right? I can still say, okay, for every x that's over here, I can see where it lands and push probability mass there. And so what I end up with is effectively a sum. For every z, I need to look at all the x's that could land in, in that neighborhood and sum together terms that look like this. That's kind of annoying to do, probably um, much less convenient to work with. Then, on the way back, you got to decide what to do. Where does it go back to? Which of the x's does it go back to? Sometimes an x here, sometimes an x there. You're going to have a very poorly conditioned situation because then the z, I mean, in this case, the z that's over here will sometimes map back to an x here and sometimes map back to an x there. That is very poor conditioning in most scenarios where your embedding space then explodes into completely different things somehow um, just randomly coin toss. So even though maybe there is a way you can make it work with not invertible, mathematically, theoretically speaking, set something up, in practice it's probably never going to work well um, and even be very hard to implement anything for it. So in flow models it's assumed invertible and differentiable. So what does the training look like if we have more than one data point? We just repeat this objective. So maximum likelihood log probabilities under the density for x, but we don't directly parameterize the density for x. This is kind of just, this is just conceptual. P theta of x is a conceptual thing. There is no such thing that we have where we're like, oh, what is it? No, really what we do is we transform x into z space, model the density there, and have this compensation term because of the slope in the curve compressing or extending intervals from x to z. I need to make up for that. Okay, this can be optimized with gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. So in some sense, you're good to go. If you find a function class that is invertible, differentiable, then you can just run this and find a good set of parameters uh, theta. Now, here I've assumed that this PZZ is a given. Often that's done. You might say, oh, maybe it's just a unit Gaussian for 1D, or it's uniform distribution. Uniform, you need to make sure you map onto 0, 1, of course, with your transformation. Um, or maybe it's another simple distribution. In principle, you can also parameterize this one and learn some additional parameters. Um, it's kind of exchangeable to having more layers in the network or then uh, parameterize the distribution at the end. It's, uh, it's the same 
Um, in this case, I just set it up as um, a fixed known distribution that you need to map into. Okay, now, and a lot of your questions anticipated this, lo love those questions. Um, we know what a flow model is, like the summary at the top here, in some sense tells us everything we need to know, but we need to make some choices. We need to choose F theta, and we need to choose the embedding space density PZ. What can we choose for F theta? In 1D, an invertible function is actually not that many choices in some sense. Invertible means you either monotonically keep going up or monotonically keep going down. If you ever turn around in direction, you become not invertible. Okay? So AX plus B for positive A, where A and B are your parameters. Polynomials with positive coefficients only and only odd uh, powers. X theta times X, where theta is a parameter. Sigmoid, AX plus B. Cumulative, any cumulative density function, by the way. Sigmoid is one example. Anything that goes from 0 to 1 as a cumulative density function is monotonic, is invertible. Um, probably your BZ should be a uniform over 0, 1 then, because you're not going to go outside of 0, 1. Um, but that's, that's a reasonable choice. You can have pretty complicated CDFs. You can compose flow, so you can chain these together to get, again, a flow. Now, if you're worried in your optimization setup about this notion, oh, my parameter has to be positive, you can play little tricks like you can say, instead of having a parameter A that needs to be bigger than zero, have a parameter A bar of which you take the exponent, exponentiated version of A bar, and now you're always positive. Um, so there is ways to do that without having to introduce hard constraints on your optimization. When you look at this list, you're probably a little bit disappointed, right? Because there's nothing in there that says, um, you know, attention uh, network or anything like that. It's at least for 1D. In higher D, we have a bit more optionality, but in 1D, options are limited. Now, at the same time, 1D distributions, what, what can they really be? There's not so much they can be. If you have the choice of all cumulative density functions, you kind of have it all covered. So maybe it's okay. If your Z, your PZ here is normal zero one, it's called a normalizing flow. A lot of people talk about normalizing flows, that's what it means. Could be a mixture of Gaussians. Um, that's a reasonable choice. You could learn the parameters of that mixture of Gaussians or you could set them ahead of time. It could be a uniform, but then you better make sure F theta maps to zero one. Because if you have a uniform and you maps outside of zero one, then you'll have a zero probability, you'll take the log of a zero probability, you'll have a negative infinity, your optimization will blow up. Yes? Yeah. So, first of all, clear my question. So, uh, here, um, this, this sort of map with the function class equation and then the embedding, in, in, in embedding space is the solution. This is sort of saying that whatever function we learn with, with whatever parameters that folks transform are input into some sort of like weak space. This is saying that. Um, we would choose an easy uh, distribution, for example, like a Gaussian, and then the output of the model that we learn should be the parameters of a Gaussian. Um, I'll, I'll give some examples soon. So why don't we hold off on that question for now? Okay. Do you have another question, or was it re uh, very related? Then maybe we also hold off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess I'll put it. Um, I guess the other question was, um, so I see that the functions listed here are sort of like the easy, like modelable equations, just whatever. Mm -hmm. As far and I know you talked about you know learn that those have to be constrained to some stuff it to be invertible. Um, like what are the parameters? Like how how does one? Well, what first do people use neural networks to sort of represent the parameters of this flow model? Okay. Hey. Yeah, let, let me let me let me defer that question to later. Okay. But it, it's the right question. It's the right anticipation of what we need to think about. Okay. But I have a bunch of slides on that, and so I'll wait till those pop up. Okay. 
Let's look at some examples. So we have a density um, here that we just visualize. In principle, we would just have data, right? Some samples, but I'm visualizing here the density that these samples are coming from. We have an initialization of our flow transformation, which results in this density over here for Z. So just to be very clear, this side is X, this is a flow X to Z, and then this is Z. Um, after training, because we're fitting onto a Gaussian uh, unit normal uh, distribution, we learn a F theta of flow that indeed transformed this original density, which has two peaks, into a Gaussian, you know, approximately um, one, one peak. Uh, maybe just need a little bit more training to, to smooth that out. Um, so that's one example of what could happen or what you could do. Here's another one. We go to uniform. So it's uh, essentially um, the same distribution, but now shown in a sampling way. Again, left is x, middle is the flow. On the right is the resulting distribution for z. Initially, it's obviously a very simple transformation. Um, it is not anywhere close to uniform. Um, it still has those two peaks. Then when it's, the learning is done, um, it transforms this two-peak distribution that could go anywhere on the real line into a 0-1 uniform distribution or close to it. Here's another example. Again, on the left, it's x. In the middle is the flow. On the right, it's um, the transformation z samples, uh, the resulting transformations. Initially, again, the flow here is just a symbol um, sigmoid. We map onto a beta phi 5, which is a more, it's a peak distribution, but still over the 0, 1 interval. Um, think of it as like a Gaussian with finite support. This may be, you know, crudely speaking, what a beta phi 5 is. Um, Initially, you still see the two peaks come through, but then it learns a flow that models it into the beta phi 5 distribution. Okay, so 1D flow models, quick summary. Um, we start from some X space. It's not a good space to directly put simple distributions in. That's why we transform it into a new space, and we hope that we can force that transformation to be good enough that we can use a simpler uh, PZ in this new space that is easy to work with. It's also hopefully easy to sample from, because when we sample from PZ, we invert F theta, we get X back out. It's easy to evaluate the probability of a new uh, data point you get. So sometimes we, we've solved everything. We've already anticipated a pain in terms of expressiveness, but all the boxes are checked in terms of what we expect from a generative model. All right, now let's look at a special case which comes up quite a bit. Let's assume z, f theta of x, is a cumulative density function. And pz is going to be uniform 0, 1. Okay? What does it mean to be a cumulative density function? Cumulative density function means that essentially when you have a regular density, let's say um, p... I'll just, well, I might use x, px of x, uh, the density um, assigns this probability to each interval. So you might have a density that might look, who knows, maybe like a Gaussian. Then the cumulative density function, or CDF, So she integrates all probability encountered so far. So it goes up, it goes up steeper, steeper. It is the steepest at the peak here at the top. And then it starts, the slope attenuates. And then the slope becomes zero because it becomes zero here. And this cumulative density will go from zero to one because it's integrating all probability mass from negative infinity to where you are right now. And that total should be one. Okay, the PDF and the purple one lives on a different scale. I guess otherwise it's not going to integrate to one probably. So that's a CDF. The interesting thing about a CDF is that when you use a CDF, you map onto zero one. So you can use a uniform distribution 
as the Z distribution, which is a convenient one to work with because the term that involves Z doesn't even do anything. It, uh, there's nothing to optimize there. It's just always a constant. So you just have the other term to deal with. Something that's kind of intriguing, if you look at, let me see if I have it on the next slide or oh, I have an example here. So a more complicated example. If you look at this double bump, you get this cumulative density that kind of ramps up fast at the first peak, then slows down, ramps up even faster again at the next peak, and then gets to one. You can sample um, via the inverse. So if you sample in zero one uniformly and then map it out through the inverse of that cumulative density, you get a sample out. So really what I've told you here is that a cumulative density function is a flow that flows your original distribution for x right onto uniform. So in some sense you say, well, you know, what would I want to find? That might be a pretty good one to find. If I'm using PZ uniform, then essentially I'm looking to find this CDF in my sequence of function approximations. Um, so you can think of that special case where the end is uniform as everything in between, effectively modeling the CDF in some way, because that's when you get the best fit to your data, and that's what you'll end up with if your optimization works out well. And it's easy to sample from, um, just as we described. Now, one thing that's intriguing about this is if you look at the equation here, right, we're training a flow model, and let's say the final thing is uniform, so this is uniform, uniform 0, 1, so that's a constant, doesn't do anything in the optimization, all you're left with is this part over here. And now if f theta is a cumulative density function, so we have d, the CDF, with respect to x of x, this is actually equal to p theta of x. So in this very special case, there's just a very close correspondence to directly modeling your p theta of x. So if all you do is you put in one cumulative density function, that's all you do, and map onto zero one, it's equivalent to directly modeling the corresponding probability density, which you kind of want it to be, but I just want to point that out. So the simplest flow where you say, oh, I use a CDF of a Gaussian to flow onto uniform is the same thing as just fitting a maximum likelihood Gaussian to the data. If you say, I'm going to flow with a CDF that is a mixture of Gaussians, that's the same thing as fitting a mixture of Gaussians to the data. Now, of course, the beauty of neural nets is that you want much more complicated stacking of expressiveness before you get to the other side, but in the very simple scenarios, it degenerates to kind of what you'd hope for, but also means that it is not doing much in those cases. Yeah, so this is the, the slides version, typeset version of what we just uh, looked at. You might wonder how general are flows? Can every smooth distribution be represented by a normalizing flow? Well, just think about 1D for now. Who thinks every distribution can be represented by a, a flow? Some of you. Okay. Some of you raised your hands. Here, here in front. You raised your hand. Why do you think it's the case? Wow. I think if it's not, people would lose hope on this. I like it. So it's a strong prior on why people even spend time on flows. If it's not capable of doing this, why, why would we even study it? Um, that, that's a pretty good prior. Um, I fully agree with that uh, sentiment. Um, and we're going to give a slightly more first principles answer um, in, in what we're going to derive here. I just showed you that to go from x to uniform just requires the CDF of x. So assuming I make my flow expressive enough to be able to represent any CDF, let's say a mixture of sufficiently many Gaussians or a um, let's say, um, a mixture of logistics um, CDF with enough components, I can flow x from x to uniform. If on the output I want the z of any distribution, I can find a flow from z to uniform the same way. So I can get x to uniform, I can get z to uniform. Now I just invert this guy. I take the inverse of that guy, put it over here, and I end up with a flow that goes from any distribution over x 
to any distribution over z. So in that sense, it's very general. Um, that doesn't mean it has the right and of bias always and trains the fastest and so forth, but it shows that it is possible. Okay, um, quick recap for fl of flow models in 1D. Flow is a differentiable invertible mapping from X, which is the data, to Z, which is your noise space. You train it so that it turns a data distribution into a base distribution PZ. The common choices are uniform or standard normal for PZ, that is. This is the objective you optimize. And at the bottom, here's an example. Your F goes from X to Z and F inverse goes back. Um, this here was flown, uh, the flow was done to a Gaussian, uh, use your sample from a Gaussian and then invert to get a sample from the original distribution over X. The reason I like to continue putting this up front here, even though you don't really directly use it, is to clarify that this is actually what we're doing. We are correctly modeling a density over X by following this prescribed formula uh, that you need to use when you do a change of variables and model densities. Yes? Uh, is there any point in choosing anything other than uniform distribution for Z? Uniform is very popular. You just need to make sure you end up between zero and one, otherwise you have trouble, but you can do that just in the last layer if you want. One reason you might not want it is because maybe as you squash things between zero and one, you your gradients kind of flatten out, and so maybe it's it's harder to get signal if you're not exactly initialized in the right space. And so maybe flowing onto a normal has less of those issues compared to flowing onto a uniform zero one. Um, but if you have good, good ways to resolve that and get your gradients to come through just fine and the signal flows, you know, free optimization, then in some sense, it's fully general because you say, if I map onto a normal, I can just follow it by a normal CDF, and that'll turn it into zero one. So if I just hard code that last layer, I'm effectively, you know, flowing onto a uniform. And as long as the last layer has the, you know, that capacity, then it's, it's kind of the same. It's just adding one layer to switch between uniform and, and normal. Okay. Well, we looked at this. Look at this. Oh, I think the PDF retained some slides that I wanted to skip, so I skipped over them. Let's look at 2D flows now, which will start giving us some intuition about what we can do in higher dimensions. Let's start with autoaggressive flow. It's a very specific choice, but given we already covered autoaggressive models, it could be pretty natural to think about autoaggressive flows. So in autoaggressive flow, we go x1 to z1, which is what we just did already, nothing new there. But then x2 gets mapped to z2, but you get to use x1 and x2. So you're really turning x1 and x2 into a z2 together. Um, so you can only generate, well, you can actually do this in parallel. The training can be done in parallel, but then when you go in the other direction, you sample, you'll need to wait. The first one you invert just the same way, it's a 1D flow, you just invert it the way we've been doing it. But then the second one here, um, when you invert it, you need to, this one has a, let's see, you have Z2 that is sampled, but you need to wait for X1 to have been generated before you're able to invert. So it's a, kind of an interesting situation, just like in autoaggressive models in last lecture, when you're sampling, it's very slow, it's one at a time, but when you're, when you're training, it all goes through in parallel, you can train very fast. You might say what's really different from autoaggressive models that we saw in last lecture is in some sense the way we model the distribution. It's still essentially the chain rule that we're applying. It's now the way we model the chain rule is by, instead of directly putting down a P, a distribution for the next variable, we say we're gonna model it as a flow into a new variable which we then have a parameterized distribution for. Um, but a lot of strong similarities. Let me pause here, because this is probably the, 
you know, the most important base case for everything that comes in higher dimensions. Yes? Great question. Why why not use Z1 here instead of X1, all right? That's called an inverse autoaggressive flow. So that exists too. We'll talk about it. They're both reasonable models, and we'll, we'll talk about both. Um, I agree. Both are reasonable choices. And the beauty of taking in Z1 there, you don't have to wait at sampling time. It does turn out that then at training time, and we'll see that soon enough, you'll get kind of almost the counterpart of an RNN, where the Zs are the hidden state, and you need to wait for the previous Z to be generated to be able to generate the next one. So training will be serial like an RNN in the inverse flows, inverse autoaggressive flows, but then sampling will be fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whichever is more important. You care more about fast training or more, uh, more about uh, fast uh, sampling will determine which one of the two you want to use. And there are some ways to get the best of both, uh, which we'll also talk about. Oh, something I want to really highlight here is that the dependence on X1 in F theta 2 can be arbitrarily complex. So when, when F theta 2 is computed here, it takes in an X1 and X2. It turns X2 into Z2, and that needs to be invertible. You're constrained to make that invertible. But X1 is a given. It's like a known when you're doing that. And the way you use X1 doesn't matter. As long as, you know, no matter what choice of X1 makes this thing, whole thing still invertible, so you need to take care of that. But there needs to be nothing particularly constraining about how you process X1 there. So let me show you an example. Um, Let's say I have X1 over here. It goes into a mixture of Gaussians, cumulative density function transformation, two components in this case. The means and variances are the theta1 parameters, turns it into Z1. Next step, um, I'm going to transform X2 into Z2, also with a mixture of Gaussians, cumulative density function. What I can do is these parameters mu and sigma can depend using any arbitrary neural net structure here on X1. So the, in some sense, the interaction you create between X1 and X2 can be pretty rich to achieve Z2 in the sense that your X1 can be processed by any neural network in this branch, not in the top. In the top, X1 is just passed through a cumulative density function to map it onto the corresponding Z. So the, the top path here for X1 is very simple, just like, Cumulative density, see where you map. But the bottom path for X1 can be anything. Models with attention, convolutions, anything you want can all go in there. So that's where more expressiveness is starting to come in. In 1D, we don't have that because in 1D, just if the one variable needs to be invertible, can it have no, no wiggle room in 1D to go anywhere? In 2D, we start having more wiggle room. Another thing that's interesting to think about is that a composition of flows is still a flow. So if you were like, man, I really want to non-linearly process X2 also at some point, you can just stack another one behind it here where you swap the roles of X1 and X2, and it's still a flow because it's just two flows composed together. In the autoregressive models we looked at before, you had to follow a strict ordering. You couldn't like let things in arbitrary ways depend on each other. But here, because we enforce the invertibility, we're able to put flow after flow after flow. So you can actually start getting pretty complex once you have just two dimensions and what you're able to express. You can repeat this multiple times uh, after each other. And so you can actually get a lot of more complex calculation happening on these. Of course, it would be happening on Z2 here and Z1. So what I'm saying is that were another flow stack there, I could um, first do Z2 with a simple cumulative density function flow. And then I could, for Z1, condition in a complex way on Z2 to get its transformation out. Question? Yeah, absolutely. So just to be clear, the let me 
let me erase what um, I drew on the slide for a moment. Let's see. So X1 is over here. When it goes through the CDF to get onto Z1, that's a very simple thing. That's essentially, I have X1 living here. I have Z1 living here. I have a mixture of Gaussian CDF, which we know what it roughly looks like. It bumps up and it bumps up again, All right? Going from zero to one. So that top mapping, where, where it jumps up, that's essentially mu1 and mu2. And then how wide that bump is corresponds to sigma1 and sigma2. That's parameterized up there, right? And this X mapping is very simple. You just choose it. Whatever your X is, you have to go right through it. That's your only choice. You can just change that CDF for a little bit. Now at the bottom here, we're essentially doing the same thing for X2. Now, when we're doing this for X2, we also have a essentially a mu1. I actually called it mu2 one on the slide because other because it could be different than the other one and a mu2 two, two and we can choose where they land and what I'm saying is that I can I don't need to just independent of x1 choose where they are I can let my choice of mu's depend on x1 I can take a neural network that processes x1 and decides what these mu's are and so what that means is that, for example, if I have a distribution that maybe, I don't know, looks like a lot of mass here and a lot of mass here, and this is x1, and this is x2, what I can model then is this notion that if x1 landed somewhere here, which means that most likely x2 should be somewhere here, I can model that because I can effectively say if x1 lies over there, my mu has to be roughly there. Even with a single mu, I could actually model this. If my neural network is complex enough, I can have the mu take on this value here for x's that x1s that are here. And I can take the mu take on this value for x's that are out, x1s that are out here. And so this, the reason it stays invertible is because to go back from z2 to x2, it doesn't matter where I drop those mu's. Um, wherever they landed, I know where they landed because I know the calculation from X1 to those mu's. So I know the CDF. I can just look up in the CDF to go back from Z2 to X2. So, so yeah. So the sequence would be, I guess, in your 1DK, there were some derivation sort of motivating like the requirement of it being invertible. So I'm guessing with what you just did over here, how does that sort of match that to some of those equations? Mm -hmm. uh, like, I guess one question is like, I guess, so I'm guessing that none of this, like, you know, I can take some X1 from a neural network and then use that to some of my means. I guess that does not mess up any of whatever mathematical, mathematical derivation that would apply to this case. And then I guess then another question too with this is, would that then make your invertible function from V to X dependent, dependent on V1, which is, derived from an invertible, uh, invertible function Yeah, so the inverse of this one here, f theta 2, when I want to invert it, I will need to know x1, because I used x1 to generate this CDF here. And without access to x1, I don't have access to that CDF, so I cannot invert. So I need access to x1, or because we know z1 and x1 can be mapped between each other, access to Z1. Either way, I need access to that information to be able to produce the correct mu's that give me this CDF. But that's all I need to remain invertible. The, the complexity of how these mu's depend on X1 does not affect the invertibility. I just need to know that for a given X1, there will be some mu's, and then I can use them to go back and forth between X2 and Z2. And we'll look at the math, I think, on the next slide here, which what you were asking about. This is what it looks like. So you have a, well, you have two terms now because there is two variables. There is going to be Z1, Z2. There's a change of variable um, transformation 
component, the log of the derivative of uh, the function at that point. And at the top here, I wrote it with z's, and at the bottom here, I wrote it with f theta 1 and f theta 2. Um, but that's essentially the same thing, um, just a different notation. Um, the f theta makes it more explicit that you're learning a function from x that becomes um, the z, and then the d if you write it like at the top, it's more just saying, oh, it's, you know, it's just wherever um, x lands on z space. The, these are, this, the bottom one is what you would normally use, naturally, because that has all the information you need. And so now you have a term like before, and an additional term at the bottom that is extremely, extremely similar. Um, and that's it. If you stack multiple sequences of these together, you effectively get multiple of these terms, of these transformation terms, because those are the transformation modeling ones, and then the one in the front here is just the last one, that's the density of the z at the very end. But if you had more than one layer, you get many of these uh, summed together. So let's look at some examples. Um, this is our data distribution, okay? The colors are different just to give some sense of where the data maps to, right? It's one distribution, but it's natural to think of it as two classes, there's two half moons, but the model does not have access to some classification label or anything. It's just a visualization to have some samples be yellow, some samples be purple. We took a base distribution which is uniform. So we're gonna map onto uniform. We use a CDF, that's a mixture of five Gaussians to go from X1 to Z1. So it's just one layer, we do not, not any stacking or anything, just X1 to Z1, mixture of five Gaussians, CDF. Then X2 is also a mixture of five Gaussians going to Z2, um, but conditioned. So the parameters are conditioned on X1. Before training, this is what we end up with. Latent space here means Z space, so Z1, Z2. That's not going to score very well because the uniform distribution puts equal mass everywhere, but we're not using that mass very well with this mapping. A lot of the mass is getting lost. Um, but then as we train, we see that these samples spread out, spread out, and we end up with this thing over here. And this thing here next to it is the, um, the density in X space. So you can see it actually modeled the density in X space quite well with this. So in, in some sense, this is, I think, very surprising and intriguing, because this was just a one thing. It was just like one layer. We didn't even stack any layers, and we modeled the two moons problem, which is kind of a complicated configuration, and we turned it into a uniform pretty cleanly. And I can give a little bit of color and subjective opinion on it. When I look at this, I'm both excited and I'm disappointed. And I'll say why I'm also disappointed. The reason I'm disappointed is because some of the yellow points land extremely close to some of the purple points. Right? Which means that there's an extreme sensitivity. When I sample in the uniform space and I sample close to that boundary, where I end up could wildly vary based on just a small perturbation where I sampled which is usually for an embedding space not the right thing. Usually for an embedding space, you want things that are nearby that actually represent similar things in the original space. But here, you get have points that are very nearby, and one of them is in one moon, the other one's in the other moon, and there's like a gap in between. There's literally no data in between. It's an empty space, yet they are so close together. Now you might say, hey, you just took the wrong thing. Why did you take uniform? These are clearly two, <laughs> two clusters. You should have done, you know, a mixture of two Gaussians as the base distribution, and then you would have had a much cleaner solution. I agree with that. That is definitely what would um, would have cleaned it up. But then you kind of pose with the challenge, like how many Gaussian components do you need and so forth. You start getting a lot of questions in terms of um, hyperparameters you need to choose to get this right. Not for the two moons. It's obvious that the base distribution to, you know, a mixture of two Gaussians is a great base distribution rather than uniform. But in general, you don't have in high dimensions the visibility in your data set. And so, you can end up with things like this because it's so, it just gets it done. We thought it's not expressive. Actually, it's quite expressive. It just gets it done. It optimizes the objective so well that I think we end up with something that actually isn't that great in terms of embedding space. Um, so we somehow are still faced with the question of, 
designing an embedding space for Z that is a natural one for our data so we land in a good spot, which is kind of unfortunate that we would still have to do that effort. If you do that effort, then maybe things work out great, but you'd hope for models maybe that don't require you to design your embedding space so carefully. And what do you even have available in your embedding space? Mixture of Gaussians and uniform, a couple of other things. You don't have that many options. So it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, I would say. Um, here's another one. Here is um, a flow um, that goes from this face density, which has three clusters to uniform. Again, it nails it. It knows how to model density. So if all you care about is a really good density model, you might actually be quite happy, but if you care about embeddings, you might not be as happy in this case. Let me postpone questions for just a, a little bit, but I, I saw your hand. Well, actually, we are at the last slide for 2D. Yeah, let's do the question now. Yeah. Well, for one, I'll say this was very subjective commentary, so take it with a grain of salt about why I don't like them landing close together. But the reason, with regards to your specific question, you know, why I think the issue here is with the choice of the PZ is because if you choose PZ to be uniform, yeah, your distribution clearly has two clusters. If your neural net, your flow is expressive enough, it's gonna make it uniform, because that is gonna score the highest. So you're optimizing a log likelihood objective that will score the highest if you turn it into a uniform. So if you're expressive enough, you'll turn it into a uniform. Now I could argue, maybe the flow shouldn't be so expressive, I make it less expressive, I'm not gonna be able to turn it into a uniform, and I can fix it that way, that might be possible. Um, you could say the uniform is about choice. I need something else there, but the choices are kind of like not that many. And so it kind of goes counter to a lot of the most successful models these days. We say the larger you make your model, the more expressive you make it, the better it's going to do. And here we're almost saying like, oh, well, we should be careful about expressing this because then it'll get these embeddings that are maybe not the ones we want. And I think that's kind of counter to the narrative of we can just scale up and get better results. Now, maybe a couple of years from now, we sit here again and we're, I'm telling a story. I'm like, hey, you know, two years ago, I said flows weren't seemingly going anywhere. But now, look, you know, it completely changed. They're the model everybody uses. It's possible. But I think it's good to understand at least the limitations that we encounter right now. Because if they are going to be the thing, we'll probably have to think hard about how to work around these kinds of things that are not intuitively satisfactory, let's say. Yes. Yeah, um, how do we introduce more inductive bias to get better embeddings effectively, right? I think one thing is indeed you change your um, end distribution away from uniform probably to have something that's more multimodal if you think your data is multimodal because that way you, you don't force things close together that don't belong close together. Um, the other thing you, you do, I think, and we'll see this in higher dimensions, um, you saw how we can essentially take x1 and have it participate in the computation of the CDF that we use for x2. Now, in a higher dimensional space, you have choices there in the architecture. Should the top left pixel contribute to the bottom right pixel CDF or not really? Or if it should contribute, should it be channeled through maybe something that combines information from many pixels to then finally have something that doesn't make it too much determinate, it's still can learn that it depends more on other pixels maybe. So I think the the connectivity pattern in here 
is where you can put a lot of inductive bias, and that's also what people have been doing in higher dimensions. And again, I think that the special thing about flows and why I do, as I said, some negatives, why I think they do give surprisingly good results is that the connectivity pattern in any given block is what it is, but then in the next block, you can switch it up. In one block, you can have the top pixels influence the bottom pixel. In the next block, you have the bottom pixels effectively influence the top ones. You can alternate this whichever way you want. You can go left, right, top, bottom, um, you know, Super resolution in some sense, like, you know, one pixel spread out, every, pixel spread out, and then fill in details. You can make all these choices in the different blocks, and the composition will still be a flow. And that's where the choice of these blocks is the inductive bias you put in, but also gives you a very different kind of expressiveness than the autogressive models we saw in, in last lecture. In the first half of lecture today, we covered the foundations of flow models, 1D, 2D, and sometimes the big questions that remain is how to represent these flows in higher dimensions. What are some of the inductive biases people have introduced successfully? So, um, we're going to model higher dimensional data now. Um, in our case, because we're looking at flow models, X and Z will have the same dimensionality. And I say high dimensional, same dimensionality on both sides, otherwise we can't invert between the two. Okay, um, autoaggressive flows and inverse autoaggressive flows we'll cover first. Um, they will be you know, one variable after the other. That's kind of the definition of autoaggressive. But there are others that we'll cover after that don't treat things that way. So, autoaggressive flows... Um, it's a bit like sampling from a base net. It's a, you know, you have a var the chain rule, you go x1, then x2, then x3. The same thing happens in an autoaggressive flow. You get x1 from z1 doing the inversion, x2 from z2, and x1, we saw that example in 2D. You can just generalize this to 3D, where now this also depends on x2. Um, so this is the setup. Um, how to fit them? This is our objective that's been all along, right? We have put logs in front of it, and then the log, log of the first term, which is the PZ, and then the log of the absolute value of the determinant for the second one. Um, this here is the general version. If you have a higher dimensional mapping, since everything in autoaggressive is still 1D mapping for each variable that's being generated, it's really just a sum of terms um, that are all one-dimensional. So Zs get generated this way, the generalization of what we saw for 2D, and this is how we go back. I like to kind of draw the picture that it corresponds to. Um, it's similar to pictures we saw last week. Um, X1 through F theta becomes Z1, then X1 and X2 through in principle, in F theta 2, we can make it all one big block called all F theta, becomes Z2. We know that this arrow here can be very complex, typically. This one here tends to be pretty simple because it needs to be invertible. So if I use different colors for invertible versus not invertible, this is an invertible process, this is an invertible process, and this is an invertible process, but then... Purple one, this one here, or this one here, or this one here. Those are essentially additional ways to parameterize the F theta as a way to think of it. And these purple arrows don't have to be invertible at all. You don't need to go in reverse on those. So much more complex things can happen on that front. Inverse autoaggressive flows, I had a question about that earlier. Um, if x1, um, essentially, one way to think is that you just make everything that used to be f theta, f theta inverse, and where everything was f theta inverse, you make it f theta. But what we end up with is at sampling time, x1 becomes a function of z1, x2 of z2, z1, and x3, z1, z2, z3. So I think it's a little easier to look at the picture. 
seeing them next to each other. And in our original autoreset flow on the left, we have these arrows that do the more complex conditioning. They are replaced by the red arrows on the right. So that's the difference. Instead of feeding in, feeding in X1, you feed in Z1. Instead of feeding in X2, you feed in Z2 and so forth. Because the mapping between X1, Z1 is invertible, information content-wise is the same thing. You're feeding in the same information. But compute-wise, it's different because now in an IAF, you can sample effectively in everything in parallel. Once you have all your Z's, which you can sample all in parallel, you can, um, when you invert, you can go right through to get all the X's. You don't need to wait for X1 to generate X2 and so forth. So sampling is fast. And here the fluid mapping is fast. Fast means parallelizable. You do it all in parallel. So put it at the bottom here. So autoaggressive flow, fast evaluation, fast training, slow sampling, inverse, the opposite. There are actually models that manage to get the best of both worlds. You might wonder how is that done? Essentially, why, why is training Why is training slow here? You're essentially turning it into an RNN, right? You go from X1 to Z1, which then has to be processed, you get Z2, and then you get to Z3 and so forth. Um, that makes the process slow. If you have essentially a corresponding functions that you set up, but you just change the arrows, so they're essentially the same, but you just change the arrows around. If you first train an autoaggressive flow, so you train this, which is fast, <clears throat> then you sample from it, which unfortunately is going to be a little bit slow, but then you sample from it. So you train, then sample, then you use these samples to train this one. You might say, that's annoying, because now I'm going to train the one that's slow to train. It turns out if you look at the details, because these are samples, if you keep the inner activations around, you can actually, if you set the architecture right and some choices you have to make in a very precise way, you can actually train the IAF fast. And so that's a way to train an IAF fast, essentially as distilling it from autoaggressive flow. You can train it fast, and then when you're done training, you can sample fast. And so if you look at um, these models here, they exploit that idea. Um, parallel WaveNet and IFVAE, this notion that you essentially distill the fast trainable autoaggressive flow into an invertible inverse autoaggressive flow, and you do it by using samples where you keep the activations around, which gives you the missing information, right? Because the reason, the reason training is slow for the IAF is because you don't have disease. But if you generated samples already, those samples had disease. Such a, and if it's multiple stacks of flows, then you also have the, sometimes disease in between and every, every, every block in between. And so if you have both disease and the axis, then you can train your IAF very fast. Uh, so best of both worlds, um, train AF fast, then sample from the AF, keep activations specifically Disease, if it's just a one, one stack thing, it's just you keep disease. If it's multiple blocks, you might keep the ones in between. And then um, you can train um, fast and sample fast. Um, naively, if you have an autoaggressive flow or inverse autoaggressive flow, this ends up being a very deep network. So if you need to first generate Z1, then Z2, then Z3, even just one flow block can be very deep. But... Um, and you'd have a ridiculous number of parameters, but of course you can do parameter sharing just like we did with autoaggressive models. You set up the same neural network to do these mappings. Um, 
And that way, using RNN, using masking, um, you can get a reasonably sized network to do this for you. Okay, what else can we do? Autoaggressive is clearly one way to go. It's given some good results. Um, the, the thing that kind of put flows on the map though was the real MVP paper. Um, and they are gonna flow with transformations that do many variables at the same time, many X's to many Z's at the same time in one invertible mapping. Um, just like we have to preserve the probability mass for each interval going from X to Z for 1D, we need to now preserve the probability mass for each volume around a certain X, see where that volume essentially maps to in Z space and make sure the same amount of probability mass lives in that volume. And so to compensate for that, there's this compensation term now, determinant of the Jacobian matrix DZ DX. If it's 1D, this matrix is just a one by one matrix, is DZ DX, that's it, it's the same thing. If it's a diagonal um, situation where um, effectively every variable gets mapped independently, then the determinant is just a product of the entries on a diagonal, and so it's again just like a rescaling along each axis, the axis x1 to z1, x2 to z2, x3 to z3, and so forth. So for 1D when diagonal, it's easy to understand that this is the correct thing to do. How do we know it's correct for arbitrary? Um, the way I like to think of it is that any kind of square matrix that goes from x to z, um, so let's say I have because locally this is all linear, so that's what we look at. If I have z equals a times x, I can also say z equals u sigma v transpose x, singular value decomposition. This is just a rotation of x space. I don't need to worry about volume preservation. Everything stays the same. I'm just rotating things. Everything's contained. Um, this is a rotation at the end, or I could even move it to the other side. Again, nothing to worry about, about the probability mass preservation. Everything is happening here. Um, and so only thing I need to worry about is the middle one, and I just need to take the product of the elements on the diagonal. Well, if I take the product of the diagonal entries, it only has diagonal entries of sigma, that is the same as the determinant of A. It's the same thing. Um, and so maybe that's how you're going to compute that determinant. Maybe you compute it in a different way. We haven't talked about how we get that determinant. But um, intuition-wise, this is why the determinant makes sense. Um, in the right coordinate space, everything's just diagonal anyway. It's the product of the diagonal elements is what you need. Okay. Um, so our change of variable formula, p theta x is p of f theta of x, which is z, and then multiply with determinant. Determinant. By the way, there's absolute values around this. Make sure that it's a positive number we multiply with. Um, that was also true before. You also have to look at the, you don't want to end up with negative densities. And this then becomes a training objective. So, the requirement, if we map a vector of x's into a vector of z's is that that mapping is invertible. So f theta has to be invertible to go back from z to x. That might put some constraints on it, and we'll talk about that. An additional requirement now, determinant must be easy to calculate. Because if we can't calculate this determinant easily, then we have a very expensive training process. Because we'll need access to that determinant to do our training. Okay. So you're going to want to start thinking about, okay, what kind of <coughs> mappings have, you know, where the, all the local linear approximations have convenient um, determinants to compute? By the way, if the determinant is not easy to compute, it's still a flow. It's just a flow that you can't really train. You have no computational approach to train it. And determinants in general are actually very expensive to compute. Um, so for a general matrix, um, Kind of the worst case scenario is essentially that you need to do something equivalent roughly to the SVD, which is a quite a bit of work to then multiply the diagonal elements together. 
Um, you don't have to do exactly that. Um, it turns out that if your matrix is lower triangular, everything above the diagonal is zero. It's also just the product of the diagonal elements, and so that's kind of what we'll be thinking about. Well, the term that's easy to compute means the upper triangle is all zeros, um, or more than that is all zeros. Um, so anything that has that property will be convenient to work with. Um, so you'll see that pop up a lot. Remember that even though we're constrained for each mapping to make it convenient and invertible and easy determinant, we can stack them together. And we already saw with auto regressive flows, it allows us to change the ordering along the stack and be more expressive than the auto regressive models from last time, even though within each stack, we're a bit more constrained. Question here. Yeah, it's a good question. How do we ensure that these properties hold? And that's exactly what we'll talk about for the next several okay. slides. So it's a perfect question. It's not easy. I mean, some people have figured out some ways to do it, but it's still restrictive in terms of what you can and cannot do. Question here? Is there like a dimensionality to like each one of the components of each of the methods for like in between? Because you're dealing with essentially no dimensionality reduction at all? Or yeah, it's just like there's both a, a, a chain of a functional network that can be arbitrarily complex. It's like, is there a point where this thing gets too long and it's just like not practically feasible at all? I think it's a good question, right? Given you are constrained in what you can express, is it the case that by making the chain long enough, you still have full expressivity? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. That's an interesting question. And then the question from there then becomes, if the chain is very long, how long does it really have to be? And does it become impractical, both in terms of compute, but possibly in terms of gradients propagating? Because the deeper a network, the more trouble you have with gradients propagating well. So there could be additional considerations like that. Yeah, I don't have a precise answer, but I'm just rephrasing your question as indeed a great question. So... What can we do? We can do affine flows. <laughs> Pretty simple, just linear. Um, linear connection between x and z. Um, so one block would just be x equal az plus b or z equal ax plus b, depending how you set it up. The Jacobian is a or a inverse, depending on which direction you set it up. You need to calculate the determinant of a, so maybe a should be lower triangular to make that easy, and that's the maximum expressiveness in some sense that you get um, without becoming very expensive to deal with. Element-wise flows. You could essentially make the functions as a whole just element-wise calculations. So each element gets transformed on its own to the next layer. Whoops, table came apart. Um, careful that it doesn't drop in there. Fixed. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe not for leaning, though. <laughs> There's more table space here to lean against. Um, now you might say, why would diagonal be a great thing to use? Well, diagonal on its own, you kind of lose everything about it being a high dimensional data set where you have patterns that are connecting the dimensions. But maybe you have a layer that is uh, fine followed by a layer that's diagonal, which introduces some nonlinearities, and then you go again at fine, and so forth. So that's the idea here. The nice slash real MVP line of work essentially can think of it as almost like a block version of autoregressive. So it says, my first half of Z variables, I just pass on the Xs. Do nothing with them. In principle, you could maybe put something else there, but for simplicity here, for this one layer, you can have many of these stacked together, but this one, you just pass it on. And then the second half, you're allowed to process that first half of X in whatever way you want, because you'll have it available when you go inverse. So you turn it into 
In this case, um, I think this dot in this case is typically an element-wise product. If you turn it into an L, you know, essentially a diagonal matrix is the way to think of it. But you could do anything you want, nonlinearity with the first half of the axis when you do this, and then multiply it element-wise with the second half. So you can get a pretty nonlinear transformation of your variables this way. Um, and it's easy to invert because once you have the z's, it's very easy to get back to the first half of the axis. Once you have the first half of the axis, you can compute this. Once you have this here, which is just a, a diagonal multiplied in, you can just solve to, um, to get the um, other axis out um, by essentially bring this to the other side and then divide by this and you're good to go. If you spell it out, what it comes down to is the Jacobian matrix. You just pass things on in the first half. That's a Jacobian, that's identity. Then the way the first half of the variables influences the second half um, is um, through this thing over here, which is pretty complicated, but it lands over here. And then the way the second half influences itself is by just multiplying in this. So it's pretty simple, just that diagonal over there. So what we see is that um, you just have a diagonal, take the product of the diagonal, everything above is zeros, and you can very efficiently compute the determinant. Real MVP actually got some pretty good um, results. The key thing is that the coupling layers can really allow you to put anything kind of neural net on those coupling axes from first half to second half. Remember, in these flow models, when you stack them together, when each component is a flow, the stacked version sequenced together is still a flow. So first half, second half doesn't have to stay the same. For the next one, you go with a different ordering. Next one you go with yet a different ordering. So it's not that there is this specific ordering effect that is going to um, have to be persisting throughout the entire calculation. Here are some faces generated by this is 2017. Some generative models weren't all that good yet and very promising. Um, faces, I think this is bedrooms, this is um, buildings, and then I guess this is outdoor scenes of some type or other. Um, pretty good for that time. There are some details. In goes a 32 by 32 by the number of channels, which is three uh, RGB image. Um, and then there's a question, how do you order these variables? Essentially, uh, the, the variables so that you can do this conditioning in more complicated ways. What's the first half? What's the second half? And um, this is the, the layout in terms of um, words. But essentially, in picture, some of the conditioning, um, this checkerboard pattern where you alternate, so one and five and four and eight are in the first half, and then two, six, three, and seven are in the second half. That feels a lot like a diffusion model where you're getting you know, something that's a subsampled version first, and then you work your way to get a higher resolution version. Um, other ones can, in principle, go top down, left, right, and so forth. It's not as, as common. And then at some point, you effectively start turning these things into channels. You just give them meaning. You just say, okay, now I think of what came out of this as one of the channels that lives over here. And then you can run over the image that's a lower resolution image. But again, it's, it's your own imagination of how you group variables. But it's a way to give structure to it where you're essentially saying, there's now a channel dimension that represents the upper left right, uh, upper, upper left corner. And then upper right corner, bottom left corner, bottom right corner. You cannot reduce the dimensionality because that's not invertible. So anytime you reduce, let's say, a factor two, the channels go up by a factor two, or two by two reduction, 4x channel increase. Um, you can also do these things within you know, one location. Just do something there that's very close to the element-wise forward running. That's also going to be a pretty uh, cheap Jacobian uh, to, to have the determinant for. Um, good versus bad partitioning. So 
checkerboard, channel squeeze, channel on squeeze, checkerboard. That gives you this, which is pretty decent. This is like top half, bottom half, left half. That doesn't really give the effects you're looking for. Um, in some sense, it seems ma magical, right, that you can do this. You can switch the ordering everywhere, but it, it kind of somehow is inspired by a base nets, but every block is like a base net, and then it could be a different structure on the next block. Um, I think I wanted to skip this slide, but the PDF version retained everything. Um, so, real MVP and autoaggressive models, those are the two main ideas that had worked well for flows, but none of it had worked super well. Then the GLOW, Flow++ Plus Plus, and Fjord papers came about that made things work as well as the best models of other types at the time. Yes? So you talk about this slide here, right? So sampling, we need to go from Z to X. For the first half, as, as you said, of course, it's identity mapping, so trivial. For the second half, you then plug this in here, which gives you S theta. S theta is a diagonal matrix, by the way, so it's very easy to deal with. So this is essentially just d over 2 equations, one equation for you know, each variable. And you can just directly solve it for each of the variables, right? Because it'll look essentially like this. These are the, this thing here is that equal to, then I'll draw it as a diagonal matrix. The S's are here, and this is S. This is x that you're solving for, this is z, and this is plus t, which is also known. So you're just solving this pretty simple linear system for x. By the way, some things in the inversion that I didn't talk about can sometimes be a little tricky, um, because imagine you're, you're using a cumulative density function somewhere along the way in the element-wise layers and you're using a you know, mixture of logistics or something. It turns out that the forward pass in the mixture of logistics is quite straightforward, but then the backward pass, um, you might have to do more work. So some, some functions are invertible but require a bit of work. But if the function is just one dimensional, sometimes you're willing to pay the price. Because if it's to invert a one dimensional invertible function, you can always do it by bisection search. You kind of just keep, you say, okay, I'm gonna guess the x I'm going to get is going to be somewhere in this interval, and I just keep bisecting till I find the one that actually lands corresponding to the z that I sampled. But once you're higher dimensional, you can't do bisection search, so you need to really structure it to make sure the inverse is efficient. A couple of questions, yeah. Good question. Um, my hunch is people tried it and it didn't work very well, but I can't give you hard facts on that. Um, now, it might work better than some very poorly chosen partitioning orderings, um, but I think the notion of sometimes doing local calculations and from there generating a deeper channel dimension and working your way through in the way that confidence them to organize how information gets processed and um, somehow put together in a more meaningful way than the original input, that I think has given the best uh, results. Yes? Yeah, you can, I mean, essentially do, yeah, r r run run multiple, I guess, training runs, and then try to find which orderings tend to work better, and then learn a model for that. I haven't seen people do that, no. Uh, 
So as I said, um, Glow, Flow++, Fjord are the ones that really made um, flow models work as well as the other best um, methods at the time. By the way, the, the Flow++ plus plus paper is one we did here at Berkeley. Jonathan Ho did that one in 2019. And then in 2020, he did diffusion models, and then he made his Flow++ plus plus paper a little obsolete, I guess, for the time being, um, because then diffusion models took over. Um, but, you know, you don't notice things ahead of time. So when we think about the coupling transformation between X and Z, and this is looking at in, in the opposite direction, um, you somehow have this like ordering aspect to it. It could be with blocks. It could be more refined orderings uh, to make sure things are invertible. Um, what you can do and was done in BIOS in the Flow++ paper is to use more complex nonlinear coupling layers. So after you have that linear transformation, um, you might use CDFs and inverse CDFs for mixture of Gaussians or logistics, giving you more than what you got out of what was used before. Um, there's not a paper, paper neural importance sampling. They used piecewise linear and quadratic functions that also helped. So essentially, putting more in the coupling layers was one thing we did. So mixture of logistics, um, and then self-attention, right? The component that can do anything, where you process something to then multiply it into the other variables, the part where you can do any neural network transformation, um, we're the first ones to introduce self-attention into that. That also helped quite a bit. And so what you see here is the full model we had achieves 3.165 bits per dim. That's a compression level. That was best among the things we tried. If we remove the self-attention from the neural net, we do worse. It matters clearly. If we go to affine coupling rather than mixture of logistics, we do worse. Um, and if we don't do the dequantization, which I'll talk about soon, we do a lot worse. Um, so that was essentially the, the worst thing if you didn't do it. Um, but all three of these really mattered to get the best possible results. There's a question somewhere. Yes? Um, could, could you go back to the slide? Sure, sure. Yeah, so it's a good question. How to, and then there's two ways to think about the flow models that you're highlighting. One way to think of it is that in some sense we are choosing parameters of a distribution over X, but in a very special way. Um, uh, but in the case where we use a CDF as our flow, we are doing the exact equivalent of that. Um, and so that's one view on it. If we don't use a CDF as our flow, it's not so easy to see that parallel. And so for the more general version, it's easier to think of it as just, I need an invertible transformation that I can efficiently compute. And 
It doesn't need to be a CDF. It could be, but it doesn't need to be. And so in that case, there is no such direct counterpart of just thinking of it as parameters of a distribution. Um, and it probably makes it easier to think of these models that way. Because um, now you're just thinking, okay, all I'm doing is an invertible transformation, one space to another space, and that's it. By the way, I think flow models are kind of the most difficult models to wrap your head around, at least for me. Um, so there might also be why it's harder to make progress on them because it's just, I mean, the first time I saw any of this, I was just like, my reaction was none of this makes sense. Like, <laughs> are you sure they actually did what they described? Because it's so complex. There's so many little subtleties going on that it was hard to even trust that this thing was actually real. Um, after you know teaching it multiple times, even coming back to it last week, reworking myself fully into it, it took me like a week to fully convince myself that this is real. This is actually indeed correct how it works. So I'm not surprised a lot of questions pop up. Um, I feel like if I'd been in class and see this for the first time, I'd have like a question every minute, or I'd have no questions because I have no clue what's going on. It would be one or the other. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate to, to ask questions. Um, same for other lectures, but especially here. I think it's, uh, it's a pretty complicated thing to wrap your, your head around. So then um, Dirk Kingma and um, I think it was Profila um, at OpenAI did another version of this called Glow. And one of the big things they introduced was invertible one by one convolutions. If you're com are familiar with uh, ComNets, you know that they start with just kind of, let's say a three by three or a five by five, seven by seven, but then you get channel dimension starts increasing and often you just do effectively a, a mapping just within one pixel, which is now a high channel dimension pixel. And so a big thing they introduce is to parameterize invertible of these one by one convolutions to really process what's locally happening in an interesting way much larger scale training, the way they architected it, they could train at a much larger scale. And these results became like real, like, okay, now it's real faces of, of real people, uh, pretty amazing. There's an interpretation of flows as a continuous thing rather than discrete, uh, discrete blocks after each other. It's just like a continuous uh, flow. Um, with continuous flows in time, this is continuous in time, um, invertibility is essentially guaranteed because locally um, you can invert it's a benefit. Um, I don't think it's really taken off, but there might be something there. Let me, let me show you some of the GLOW results. So one thing I talked about is that flow models can give a embedding space, the Z space, and it's nice to check how good is it. Um, by the way, autoaggressive models did not give us a Z space last lecture, right? Here on the left is a original image on the, all the way on the right is an original image. So this is original, this is original. They both get mapped to their Zs. Then an interpolation happens in Z space and the corresponding samples get generated. And that's how the intermediate phases get, uh, I guess, created. Now, what are we looking for here? With a bad model, we would see a pixel level interpolation effectively where the faces in between just look like an overlay of the two faces rather than a face that in some way is still a real face but something in between. What we see here is real faces that are some combination of the two and that's what we're hoping for. So that means this model trained well in terms of getting good embeddings. Same here, two extremes are originals. What's in between is the same process for interpolation and same thing over here. Then you can also control the attributes. So how do you do that? Let's say I want to control how much. So in this case, the originals are the ones in the middle in each case. And then we want to have a slider. Make this person smile more or less. Blonder hair or darker hair. Younger or older and so forth. How do you do that? Um, after you train your model, you take a bunch of training data, you embed it, or you partition your training data. You have one partition of training data where you say this is older faces, another partition you say this is younger faces. You take the embeddings 
from both sides, take the average from both sides, take the difference between the two averages, and that represents a direction to go from young to old or old to young. And so that's how this is done. Um, so this requires some label data in some sense, right? You're effectively, for some data, saying these are older, these are younger, these are more blonde, less blonde, and so forth. But it's not a detailed labeling, and the labels are not used during training. It's just used after the fact, after you train your model, we can see that the embedding space has nice alignment with uh, some of these ideas that we'd like to have control over maybe when we generate faces or other things. Um, yeah, this is some food for thought, um, but in some sense, if you look at the logistic logistic before the sampling happens in your discrete models, um, you can think of that as still being continuous in our discrete autoaggressive models, and you can think of them as maybe also being invertible from the logistic representation back to where you, you came from. Um, I don't think that's really used by anyone, but if you are, you know, try to think about connections between the two, it's something to keep in mind. Okay, last piece, dequantization. This is from our Flow++ paper. Um, this is just a, like a, an example, of course. This is not a large-scale image training, but an example of a distribution that is effectively discrete, right? But pixels are also discrete. They're numbers from 0 to 255, and none of them are anything but an integer if you literally take your data. So if we've modeled them as continuous variables, they're essentially densities that are extremely peaked at very specific locations. If you train, what will happen is something like what you see in the middle. Um, it'll learn that there are peaks. It'll have found some peaks and put enormous mass on a few of these peaks and largely ignore the others that it didn't find. It doesn't completely ignore the others. There's a non-zero density, so it's not like it gets a negative infinity score on the others, but it really propels some of them up dramatically. To get, ideally, you could get to a positive infinity score if you really compress everything into a zero width interval, you can get infinity and get a log of infinity and get a really high score. So that's what's happening there. You can see the training score, the negative log loss, is getting better and better and better. It is very happy with the situation, but we're not getting the distribution fit that we're hoping for. So this happens with pixels. Um, what, what can we do instead? Um, we know that the density really is about modeling the mass in an interval. We need to make sure it retains that meaning. And there's a complicated derivation you can do, but essentially the idea is that when you have your data, you should put noise on it. If a pixel value is 125, you should put noise on it so it lands between 124.5 and 125.5. And re resample it every time you use it. Do that for all of them. What does that do? It removes those peaks. It smooths out your original data distribution into one that is actually a density. And now you have no trouble. Um, let me see. Yeah. Now, you might say that feels like a hack. Um, it, it seems intuitively correct, but it feels a bit hacky. Turns out you can derive um, effectively um, a bound for this. You can, you can say that if what I'm really modeling is the probability of landing in an interval and my data just happens to be in certain locations, but I allocate the probability of the interval to it, which means I have to do an integral over my continuous density, which is a bit annoying to have to do. But if I were to do that every time, and I then bound it by instead putting noise on the samples, there's a close connection between the two. It's not exactly the same, but um, if I put the right noise on the samples, it turns out it can be a, a tight bound. And so what we did in the Flow++ paper, we actually also trained it. So instead of sampling uniform, negative 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5, we train a model to decide how much mass should shift lower versus higher in that length one interval. Um, the default not learning would be uniform, and learning would make it more precise. You might say, why, why, why does learning make sense? Well, think about it. If your data distribution looks something 
like this, right, then maybe it makes sense to think that it actually looks more like this, right, and that in this interval over here, there's a slope to it. It's not uniform. And that's effectively what you capture when you learn that what, we, what is called dequantization. You say the original data was probably continuous, but it was sampled, rounded onto these quantized values. And from everything I'm learning, I now think that the original data came from this distribution, not uniform around it. And I'm going to resample it using this distribution rather than uniform. Um, flow and discrete data with dequantization, that's what we looked at earlier. For another example, we saw it had this weird, you know, peaks popping up. When we do the proper dequantization, it doesn't happen. The training loss looks much cleaner. So that's um, what we have now. So strong relationship to compression. Um, when you compress continuous data, you actually, in the end, do need to have a meaning of discretization. Because if you think about continuous data, how can you compress continuous data? One number has infinite information in it, in principle. It just keeps going, a real number. So you need to effectively, if you want to formalize this all in terms of discrete, actual compressible you know, things you can quantify as how many bits you're going to send, uh, we'll talk about compression towards the end of, of uh, the semester. So, what are some possible future directions? Remember, these are the goals. Fast sampling, fast inference, fast training, good samples, good compression. Flows seem to allow us to achieve some, maybe all of these criteria, but not all equally well. It, address, it, it pays attention to all of them. Or the autoregressive model didn't really think about embeddings, latent representations, so that's the compression part here. Um, didn't really think about those things, but flows do. Um, it's still an open question um, how to design each individual bl flow block and how to compose them into something that is going to work really, really well. These are my thoughts at the bottom. Some requirements that might pose permanent challenges. Like, you could either agree with those and then decide, I'm not going to work on flow models because I think these are kind of problematic. Or you could say, well, that's what everybody thinks. But actually, they're probably wrong. And I don't think it's so insurmountable. I'm going to write a cool paper that shows that they can do really well because I can work around this. Dimensionality preserving. Now, I should add a little color to that. The way people have achieved dimensionality reduction in flows is you do your flow, and then at some point, after some blocks of flow, for half of your variables, you decide that you stop flowing them. That you, like, you keep using identity, they don't interact with anything, you just stop flowing them. And then the others keep going. And you do that again a bit later, again a bit later. What does that do? Well, that means that the ones that still end up all the way at the end, they're the coarse representation of your image, let's say, and then the ones that join again later only, they're finer, and then even, even later, even finer. So you then hope that the ones that drop out the earliest learn to represent the fine grain details, and the one that stays stick around the longest, you hope they learn to represent the big picture sense of what's in the image. Um, you know, it, it, th that's how it's done. It, again, it, it's a very specific way of, of doing it, which feels not as flexible as what some other models do. They just say, oh, I'm going to you know, apply a layer where I reduce the dimensionality, a learned way of reducing dimensionality, and then I continue with lower dimensions. Invertibility, it's nice. We, you can get samples out in a deterministic way. Once you sample the UZ, you know what you're getting. Um, but everything we talked about seems to be the invertibility and the chief determinant requirement essentially told us this is all you get to do. You don't get to do anything but this and this type of layer. Um, so clearly, it's putting a lot of constraints on what we're putting in. Um, Maybe it's fine. Maybe the invertibility is such a great thing for some reason to have that you're willing to pay that price. Maybe not. Um, I think in an era where everything is about scaling and scale up as easily as possible and be as expressive as possible, I think we still need to see a breakthrough in flows that is as expressive as, let's say, a transformer model. Right? If you can come up with a counterpart of that, something that absorbs all single linear data the way a transformer does, while being invertible in the sense of flow models, 
Well, then all of a sudden, probably flow models will give really good results compared to what we have today, and then you'll scale them up even more, even better results. But right now, that's not the case. We don't know that yet. In fact, if you look at the homework sequel four years ago, four homeworks, this year, four homeworks, three homeworks are in the same topic, though they're quite dramatically revised because the topics have evolved. But the flow homework we've taken out in favor of a diffusion homework in this cycle, because the diffusion models are just much more widely used today compared to flow models. Let's see if I have, I think that might be the last slide, but let me check. Oh, that's a bibliography. So if you, again, I think, you know, this is what research is about. You, you take a bet and you have a belief that something might or might not be promising. If you want to dive deeper, I would suggest starting with these two survey papers. Um, get a general overview of what's been done, not been done. As you see, this is until 2019, 2021. But in my literature search leading up to this class, I didn't find really any works that have happened since then that got a lot of follow-on. So I did a search where I would look at, okay, who is citing the papers that are listed here? Like who is citing the real MVP paper? Because you got to cite it if you write a good flow paper. It must be cited. So I go to Google Scholar, I say, okay, Who's citing real MVP? Among the ones who cite real MVP, which ones have more citations, meaning that the work is likely, you know, important and people are paying attention and follow on. And literally, there, there was nothing that popped out with a high citation count as, oh, we need to go look at this and incorporate it into lecture. All the high citations effectively were the ones already on this slide. And then these were the two most highly cited ones of the 2020s, um, which, if there were a real breakthrough, there would be another paper that is, um, I mean, these are probably cited about a thousand times or something, but the diffusion paper that we wrote is cited like six, seven thousand times, and it's from the same year. So nothing of the same type has happened in the intervening time. Again, it could be an opportunity. I don't want to say you can't find something, some gem there that you discover, but right now it's not looking as promising. Um, Let's take uh, one or two more questions, and then I'll have office hours after, so we can resolve a lot of other questions in office hour. Let's start there. Yeah. When you do quantization, do you lose the use quantization, do you lose the invertibility? You can round back at the end, so in that sense, I don't think you, you lose it. Because essentially, you're adding noise, but it's within an interval. And so as you work through it, when you work your way back, as the network is invertible, you land back within the correct interval. Now, you could argue that maybe you land on something even better, in that you have actually, even in the, re but maybe your computer screen cannot represent it because you can't add more you know, bits to your, to your pixel values. But maybe the dequantization actually made it more precise that you'd have gotten otherwise, but you have to round back onto uh, the bits that you have to represent your image. Um, so the way the dequantization is done, it's, it's forced to be within an interval that keeps you where the center of that interval and also the boundary such that there's nothing else there. So it's not, the, you can't add Gaussian noise, you just add noise within the interval. And since you can't leave the interval, you land back into it. Yeah? Um, it seems like if you're gonna pay the price of like those three things, there has to be some advantage over like a DAE to use it. Do you have any intuition for what those advantages might be in like computer research in the future? Yeah, so, one of the challenges with DAEs has been historically that, um, and we'll talk more about the next lecture, um, that the latent space you end up in, it's also a continuous latent space, and that that space, if you sample from that space, very often when you map back out, you decode, you end up with something that's not so meaningful. And so what does that mean is that you need a better model of that latent space. And so the progress in DAEs in the last few years has all been around training another distribution on top of your DAE 
to model the distribution in the latent space. And then we use that learned distribution to sample from. You are on distribution and are generating good samples. Flow models might have less of that challenge because the distribution in the end is forced to be very simple and you're forcing it onto that. Um, so the samples might naturally, you know, or sampling from the Z space is better behaved because you forced it to be a simple, clean space. Um, and the avertibility, I think, ensures that no funny things happen as you work your way back. Um, so that's one thing, but then people have made progress on, um, on training the models inside the latent space of the VAE to get better results there. Um, so, I don't know, Wilson, Phil, do you have any thoughts on where, where the invertibility of flow models could pay off? <laughs> That's an answer. Yeah, I think one of the things that you also have as a benefit, but it's more resolved with other models too, is that because of the invertibility, you don't get the collapse that you might get sometimes with other models that used to be popular like GANs. You're, you're kind of forced to cover the whole distribution. That's kind of true for every likelihood model. As long as you train a likelihood model, you have to keep covering the entire distribution of your training data, because otherwise you get a very bad score. Um, that's kind of a in general property of all the likelihood models. Sure, I find coupling. My question is, so, okay. Okay. Um, if we ignore the, the A train, the scaling train, that's called the additive coupling. So the A term here is the one that can be an arbitrary neural network calculation depending on the parent variables of the variable Xi. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it looks to me exactly like Rick. So you, you, yeah, you, yeah, you can definitely construct skip connections in here if you want to. That's a good observation. Skip connections are part of what you can represent, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, how, however, if we, if we, okay, let us take A away. What we get is the, the, the determinant of this function is 1. Yeah, just to be explicit, if I want to make it into a, Skip connection, I would add a plus zi here, right? That's all I have to do. Okay, so, so h term becomes 1, let's say. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't predict that if, okay. if 1 not the policy. Mm -hmm. And this looks like a ResNet because you have the ci plus some additive term. Looks like a ResNet except that your what you calculate can only depend on the, essentially the parents of that variable. Right. So anything that comes ahead. So it starts looking a lot like a regular autoaggressive model in some sense, um, but in continuous space now. Yeah, which also applies to ResNet. The, the parent of the ResNet is the previous one. Correct. And in mm -hmm. this case, probably, if you use like the latest two halves, the mm -hmm. parent of that is the other. Mm -hmm. Which looks to me like very ResNet. Yeah, there's strong connections there. I agree. And ResNet has super, I mean, powerful architecture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is pretty powerful given, you know, the results you saw with the interpolation and the phase generation. So it's not that it's not, can't do anything. It's just, it's still seemingly more restrictive than other architectures. I don't get the restrictive part. I mean, because I, I cannot see too much difference between that equation and the ResNet equation. Mm -hmm. They should be equally powerful. Try it. Try it. See, see if you look at the details of the ResNet architectures used today, if they really are invertible. Because no. I think they often will, essentially, they will squeeze the dimensionality in various places. They will do projections as they work their way through. Now, maybe you can work around that. Maybe you can set up some kind of complicated unit. Um, and then that way, 
effectively get the information back. Um, it might be worth worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. Let me take three more questions, one, two, three, in class, and then everything else we'll do after class. Yeah. Well, definitely it's a big difference whether you optimize for classification or something else. You could, in a resonant, in principle, use it to optimize for reconstruction or other things. Um, I mean more like your exact term to determine the exchange value. Got it, got it. I think that's probably the main difference. In terms of the way it's trained, the determinant term is definitely affecting the training very directly. It's a dimensionality preserving term, which maybe it comes down to the question whether you want that or not, yeah. right? Do you want dimensionality preservation, not dimensionality, like volume, stability mass preservation um, as you process things, or do you think some things should be more compressed together and other things should be spread out more mm -hmm. than they are in the original data? So inherently that's a constraint on the flow of resonance. Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there were two more questions we're gonna do, yes. Yeah, that's a good question. And it depends on uh, the, so the question is, can you sample your Zs independently and then start generating the Xs in, first, in case of an inverse autoregressive flow all in parallel, right? Well, because it's not just working in parallel. So, I mean, that, but also, like, not even parallelizing, but just, like, as far as interdependence between different parts of the model. Got it. Yeah, so th then the question becomes, what distribution do you want to use to represent the Zs, right? And then in your sequence of blocks as you work through, the next layer of Z's, next layer of Z's, you're not doing anything. You, you just work your way through and you work your way back. But at the very, very end, you actually put a density on Z's. And that one, you have to make a choice. You could decide to choose a density over Z that is much more complex. You could, just like people are doing with VAEs right now, when they train VAEs, there's a very like intricate distribution being modeled on the latent space. In fact, latent diffusion, in some sense, does exactly that. It's like a very complicated train model on the latent space. You could, in principle, do the same thing here. I could have a normalizing flow and then train, essentially, a latent diffusion model on the final Zs to get a much more expressive set of Zs. And then maybe you can have a much more expressive model with this flow model, right? So you could do the same thing there, in which case sampling the Zs will be different from just sampling them independently from a Gaussian. And a lot of the work that was done with flow models so far, the Z space tends to be very simple. It's just a Gaussian, independent Gaussian, and you just sample from that. Um, and in principle, that maybe that should be enough, but maybe it's not enough. Maybe the right model says, hey, for that to be enough, you need such a deep model, it's not practical, it's too intense computationally, the gradients don't propagate well enough. I like the notion of a flow model for some of the modeling of the data, but now at the end, I should use a different model like a latent diffusion model to model disease, and that way the combination can give me better results. It's very possible. Okay, last one. Yeah, so mm -hmm. in any of these models, as you look at, let's say, any of these parameterized parts, um, if you were conditioning, which wasn't really done as much at the time, it became more popular in 2020, 2021, um, you can just have the neural net that encodes this also condition on any kind of embeddings or other information, uh, another image, some text, condition on it right there. Uh, no problem. All right. Thank you. See you next week.